going to get to this at the end, but at the start of it, I'd like to say that uh, Embry is going to be hosting kind of an undergraduate bioinformatics club where we're going to just do four, uh, three or four meetings during the semester where we'll learn how to use tools. And actually, the first class, we're going to be learning how to do something that the people here at KSU have, have said that they're kind of familiar with. We're going to be learning how to do it locally, and that's use BLAST. So we can create our own local BLAST database of our own sequences and uh, query it from the command line. It's a lot like what we do on the NCBI website, but uh, it can be faster if you have your own resource. So I'll get to a little more detail about that later. Um, but to start out with, I'm Jennifer Shelton from the Bioinformatics Corps at uh, KSU, all these Ks and all these names. Um, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator. And I'm going to be giving you sort of a very, very brief introduction to the field of bioinformatics. So uh, the outline for today's talk is that we're going to cover a basic NIH definition for the term bioinformatics. Then we're going to deal with two tools that we use often in the field. One is databases, and the other is assembly algorithms. And uh, finally, we're going to finish up with steps that you could take as a student on your own to uh, develop your skills with using bioinformatics tools. OK, so there are a lot of different competing definitions for the term bioinformatics. But the NIH's uh, definition for it is research, development, or application of computational tools and approaches for expanding the use of biological, medical, behavioral, or health data, including those to acquire, store, organize, archive, analyze, or visualize such data. So kind of the common thread in this definition is that we're dealing with tools that can manipulate data. And the reason we need a tool to manipulate the data, the reason why we just don't uh, get in there and manually alter it, is because these data sets that we are generating currently are getting larger and larger. And if they're not large, if it's a small data set, then we can uh, generate more and more copies of it. So they're getting too numerous for us to individually manipulate and analyze. So um, just one example of that is uh, sequencing, genomic sequencing of nucleic acids. So we can sequence DNA or RNA. And this is actually an estimate from 2011, where we estimated that we could sequence 13 quadrillion base pairs of data per year worldwide. So that kind of provides us with a new bottleneck. It's no longer gathering the data or generating the data that's a bottleneck. The bottleneck is that now everything from transporting the data from the sequencing facility to the researcher, to analyzing it, to storing it and archiving it, and uh, integrating old data with new data. It's really the analysis right now that's the, the bottleneck. Um, this is a quote that's from, I think, the a report on the molecular, on, uh, from the Association of, for Molecular Pathology in the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics, where they're talking about this kind of uh, data bottleneck, or bioinformatics bottleneck. And uh, the quote is, this unprecedented amount of sequencing information poses bottlenecks that vary depending on application at the level of uh, data extraction, analysis, and interpretation. They went on to say that these challenges have become part and parcel of the biomedical research com community where investigators have increasingly needed to incorporate bioinformatics and biostatisticians uh, into their armamentarium. Um, how You guys are all NIH, so you're a little interested in medical science, but could I just get a shout out or a guess um, or even just an indication of whether or not armamentarium is a word that you guys are familiar with? Right, so in the medical community, kind of the tools that you use to combat disease are part of your armamentarium. So they're saying you need to add bioinformatics staff to your lab if you want to make the most of this huge data sets that you're, that you're gathering. So that's kind of what I'm here to talk to you guys about, is that while you're going through and studying biology, it might make sense to try to incorporate a little more knowledge about these tools into your studies, so that you're a little bit prepared to handle that kind of data when you see it as a researcher. So this is a nice slide. Um, is anyone here familiar with the Beijing BGI, the Beijing Genomics Institute? Can I get nods, yes or no, at, uh, at Pitt State? No? No. So, OK, so BGI, the Beijing Genome Institute, actually produces 10 to 20 percent of the sequence data that's produced worldwide. It's just a powerhouse of sequencing. They just hired a 
bought a bunch of machines and hired an army of staff, and they just bust out genomes. Um, so their bottleneck, again, is the same bottleneck that we're seeing kind of across the board. The bottleneck is bioinformatics. And they could produce so much sequence data at such a fast rate that they would jam up the internet lines exiting uh, their facilities, and they actually resorted to mailing hard drives once they had uh, finished uh, with, with a sequencing project. So this uh, photo here is actually the head of cloud computing at BGI in 2011 holding a stack of hard drives, um, saying that his thoughts on the matter are that it sounds like an analog solution in a digital age. So that's kind of just, again, pointing out that massive bottleneck that we can now produce more data than we can reasonably analyze. So what kind of tools, what kind of solutions can bioinformatics offer? Um, we're going to take a quick look at two common ones that we use. And uh, before I get into databases, I already talked to KSU about whether or not they were familiar with NCBI and BLAST. Are you guys there? Have you mostly used NCBI? Yes. Yeah. Right. Do you, do you find it useful, kind of a central repository? Absolutely. Right, right. So, I mean, we use NCBI and we use those centralized databases in order to organize our data and to store and archive our data. Um, beyond that, we, we use it because it's a centralized repository, so we're all on the same page when we're talking about a particular loci or a particular gene, which is fantastic. Um, so we can think of something called gene bank that we see a lot, but we don't really realize we're seeing it on an NCBI as a flat file database. When we look up a specific loci in a specific gene, we usually see that text page that we can scroll down and see the nucleic acids at the bottom, and sometimes the CDS and the articles that, you know, that it was first reported in, et cetera. So this is actually a single record in a flat file database. So a record is uh, about one unique object, and a field is about the same kind of data uh, relating to different objects. So in uh, GeneBank, when we're looking at a single record, uh, that would be uh, all of the information that we have about this uh, single object, which is identified by the locus ID. Um, there, I think it's nm underscore zero one zero blah, 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 blah. But that's a unique key uh, to identify that particular record. We've got our fields associated with that that we'll see on every gene bank entry, or every gene bank record. So the fields are things that, that uh, we may or may not have information to fill in about, like CDS or the authors that are associated with its discovery or the organism that was harvested from. So if we think of the entire gene bank database, the reason why we call it a flat file is because if we had a large enough printer and a large enough piece of paper, we could actually print the whole thing out. So we could think of it as an, like an enormous Excel spreadsheet where we have uh, fields, like the fields of CDS, and we could just have a single row that shows all of the CDSs that are recorded in uh, GeneBank. We could also look at it record by record, column by column, and uh, take it just gene loci by gene loci. In this case, I think it's a yeast gene uh, TCP1 beta. So... If we have a slightly more complicated data structure, then we might want a slightly more complicated database. And this here is called a relational database. Um, I, I want a quick query um, at Pitt State and here. Has, has anyone used or is anyone familiar with KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes? No. Okay, we're getting no. a couple yeses. No? Okay. No. It's fantastic, really fun. Um, what they do is basically make a database, a curated database of pathways. So that's a little bit more complicated than just a single gene. So this, uh, what they, the way that they store that is something called a relational database. And what uh, makes a relational database uh, different from a flat file is that you have multiple tables rather than a single table, and you have some shared fields for the different uh, tables, but not all fields are shared. So if we go to the home page of uh, KEG, the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, we can uh, click on chemical carcinogenesis to take a look at some known pathways that are active in that. So uh, the way that they do these diagrams are schematics. The circles indicate chemical compounds, and the squares indicate gene products, so typically mRNA or protein. So we have a circle indicating a chemical compound that interacts with some gene products to create other chemical compounds, modified chemical compounds, and ultimately it results in several, ultimately it could result in several different forms of cancer. 
So if we click on that first chemical compounds, we're back at a flat file database. We're looking at a single record, and the unique key for this record is actually its compound uh, ID. So that C16038 is the unique key for this flat file compound database in KEG. Uh, if we scroll down on the fields that we have for this record, we see pathway. And right there in pathway is listed the pathway that we came from, chemical carcinogenic. Uh, carcinogenesis. So we can actually click on that and return to our original schematic of the pathway, and then we could try to see the gene product that that interacts with. Now we're back to a flat file database again, and we can see that again, pathway is a field listed for this uh, ortholog, and um, in the pathway field we have chemical carcinogenesis. We also have a unique key for this ortholog. And uh, as we scroll down, we have other fields like genes that fall into this orthology category and uh, potential actions for, for these orthologs. So again, the reason we call this a relational database is because we have relationships between these large flat file databases. So our compound, our unique identifier for our compound could be found in the compound field of our pathway flat file entry. And our pathway uh, ID in our flat file pathway database could be found in the pathway field for both our compound flat file database and our ortholog flat file database. And our ortholog unique ID could again be found in the genes field uh, for the pathway flat file database. So when you move through KEG, it feels a lot more organic, and you don't really think about the fact that you're looking at a series of interconnected databases, but ultimately that structure is what allows you to kind of get the most out of this, this data and to be able to easily traverse it and then pull back and see the whole big picture. So those are uh, flat file and relational databases, um, and that's just kind of a brief introduction into the way that we can use them and kind of what we think about when we organize them. So we're going to take a quick look at uh, assembly algorithms. Um, is, is anybody familiar with the term algorithm? Yeah? Because we have a yeah. trick. Right? So. Yes, we are. All right. So assembly algorithms, um, we're going to cover kind of the, the original workhorse assembly al algorithm called overlap layout consensus. Um, just a quick question. Are people familiar with why we have to assemble genomes, why they just don't sort of get sequenced fully intact? Right. So so that's true. Dr. Shape said that it's never done that way, it's always done in pieces, and that's actually a limitation of the technology. That as we increase length, sometimes accuracy decreases. Um, we're definitely moving towards technologies that will uh, make larger molecules, sequence larger molecules intact, but it's not where we are right now. So of the 13 quadrillion base pairs of sequence data that we can generate each year, most of this is not the full length of the original molecule, whether you're talking about mRNA or genomic DNA. So instead, um, scientists actually get back multiple copies of their genome or transcriptome generally, uh, but all in short segments between 50 base pairs and several KBs, which um, brings us to sort of the, the reason for developing an assembly algorithm. So we could think about a genome uh, in this example as a book, like say Alice in Wonderland. We go to the library, we check out Alice in Wonderland. Rather than giving us a single copy of the book, they give us, say, 60 copies of the book. And rather than giving it to us neatly bound, they put it through a shredder, um, make a pile out of it, and pass it back to us. So the, the process of reading that is, is going to require some preparation. You know, we're going to have to prepare that text before we can take a look at it. But uh, we can use that extra coverage, the fact that we have 30 copies, sort of to our advantage to reassemble the fragments. So overlap layout consensus algorithm uh, starts with the idea of ser searching for overlaps, right? Overlap layout consensus is actually the stages that you move through. So we look for uh, portions of this redundant text that overlap each other. So in this, we can see that we're starting to find those overlaps. We found that. Uh, Alice was overlaps with lice was beginning to get between lice and was, right? We have also find that uh, lice was beginning to get overlaps with the next uh, read by uh, between ice and get, 
right? So we're identifying all of the overlaps between all of these reads that we got back from our sequencing run. Once we've identified all of those overlaps, we create something called a layout graph, basically just a chart that the computer can see that shows the connection, the length of the overlap and the location of it between all of the reads. Uh, then, for the computer, experiencing this data looks a little bit more like this, where we have a pile of the reads uh, showing their overlap. And what we can actually do is move through this data base by base, taking the consensus at each base. So at the first position, we call an A. At the second position, we have two occurrences of L, so we would call an L. At the third position, we have three occurrences of I, so we call an I. So we can keep on going like this uh, until say we run into a position where there's disagreement. Right? We could have naturally occurring disagreement, or we could have something called a base calling error, where unfortunately the sequencer introduces an erroneous base into it. So something like an overlap layout consensus algorithm is typically going to use the greatest number to determine the, the victor, basically, at this location. So we have options between an E or an I at this position, lead, leaving us with either very or Vori. Obviously, Vori is the base calling error, and we also have only one copy of it. It's unlikely we would have very many copies of a, a base calling error. So uh, here, we would call an E there and continue through the process uh, in the same fashion until we've reconstructed the original sentence from our fragments, or hopefully the original sentence. That's kind of the goal. <laughs> so does that process make sense to everybody? OK. So we actually do a slightly more complicated version of assembly right now called uh, De Bruijn graph assembly. And that's because we're actually generating so much data so fast that even overlap layout consensus um, strategies kind of can't be handled by most uh, available computers. So we actually now take the reads that we get and cut them all into smaller pieces, um, which sounds really counterintuitive. We cut them all into smaller pieces and then kind of build up a more complicated version of a graph that kind of is less resource intensive, less memory intensive, and then we put it back together. So that's a process that I've used to assemble transcriptomes and genomes. Um, all of these actually were done with the Bruin graph assemblers, but all of them, if the data were more like the older sequencing data, like saying or reads or 454 reads, then they could have been done with an overlap layout consensus strategy. So with that, we can talk about steps that you could take if you want to kind of increase your ability to work with bioinformatics tools as you're uh, in uh, pursuing your education. <coughs> so I pulled this from a blog uh, called Homologous. It's a really great bioinformatics blog. And uh, they continually got asked from people what they should study if they were interested in getting into bioinformatics or if they just wanted to know a little bit more about it for their research. And what they said was sort of that there are five layers of learning to, uh, to developing your skills in bioinformatics, and that it's okay to pick the level that you want to go to and head for that, rather than, you know, we don't all need to be, develop, be able to develop new software, you know. So essentially, the first two layers are things that I think that would probably benefit people um, as young researchers. And there are also things that we have um, resources that we can help you with. So uh, layer one is using the web to analyze biological data. And it sounds like actually everyone here has already done that. When you query the NCBI database, um, when you use BLAST online, that's, that's actually what they're talking about in layer one. And you can go pretty far with that. There are actually um, genome and transcriptome assemblers that you can access online, and large clusters that you have um, the capability to access through a Galaxy or iPlant online. So you can actually really um, get a lot done in layer one. Layer two is the ability to install and run new programs. And that's what I was talking about for the Bioinformatics under, uh, Undergraduate Club. That's going to be our first exercise. Oh, hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> we don't have any signal, though. Sorry, so we're, we're a little far along in it. It's <laughs> cool. <laughs> what we just started talking about is uh, sort of Tools that, that Cambry can offer you and, and levels of understanding in bioinformatics tools. So uh, level layer two is the ability to install and run new programs. And uh, 
Right. C could we get you all to mute your mic? Because it's a little noisy. Thanks. Okay, so layer two is the ability to install and run new programs. So it doesn't necessarily need, seem like you may need to install a new programs. So you can query all of NCBI online. Why would you want to be able to install a local version of BLAST? Well, until you publish a paper or until you make your sequence data available to NCBI, it won't be in their database. But you can, in a matter of minutes, create your own local BLASTable database so that when you have a large data set that's not yet fully processed, you can still query it for orthologs of anything that you're interested in. Uh, you can also use that to annotate your database. So that's just one example of why you might want the ability to install and run your own programs. Another thing is that the, the way that they wrote new programs there. A lot of web-based tools take a lot of maintenance to develop and run. So uh, one of the things that allow, like, learning to use uh, command line and run your own programs um, would do is allow you to use the latest software as it comes out when you read about it in journal articles. So then the next le level is uh, writing your own scripts for analysis in Perl, uh, Python, or R. So just super quick, is anyone familiar with any of these languages? What about R? Have you guys ever heard of people talking about doing statistics with R? Right. So have you guys heard of uh, R, Perl, or Python? Other. Yes, we've heard of Python and Java and Perl. Yeah. Okay, so not R. And R. No. Okay, nice. word, word. Right, so uh, a lot of people say that learning to use uh, Perl or Python is very difficult, and it's not something that the traditional biologist is going to learn to use. And I actually think that uh, the fact that lots of biologists have learned to use R because it's so useful to them um, kind of gives me a little bit of ray of hope that if we can learn to use R, it's not that far off to learn to use Perl or Python. And uh, the real advantage to learning one of these scripting languages is that almost all of the data types that you're talking about are enormous text files, right? When you get a genome back, it's just an enormous text file. Same thing for a proteome. Um, does taking a course in biostatistics fit in, in this? No, uh, I think it's a t definitely a useful skill, but that doesn't actually fit uh, in, the, in the bioinformatics tools kind of category. We do, in our journal club, do a lot of talking about biostatistics, but that's because we have uh, genomic statisticians that join us, and I'm super glad we have them, and it's a great, useful thing to know about. But most of what we're talking about here is um, upstream of that. It's just generating the data. Mathematically not, not statistics. I think what they mean there, actually, is developing your own bioinformatics program, right? So... Um, so that's Perl, Python, or R. And then the higher, the higher level uh, from that would be level four, which is learning to use a slightly more difficult language like C, C++, Java, um, to implement existing algorithms, but modify them slightly. So this is where you start to be able to shape the bioinformatics tools that are available to you. And then layer five, the thinking mathematically. I, th I think what they're really getting at there is that when you develop a bioinformatics tool, you're going to have to allow it to scale up. You know, you can develop it and it can run on, say, a small bacterial or viral, viral genome, but by the time you get to eukaryote, which people would be wanting to use it on right away, uh, it may not be able to handle that, that jump in size of data, the, the data set. So, um, now I'm just going to kind of talk about a couple of KMB resources that we have that could help you address a lot of these issues. And a lot of them can be found on the same website. Um, if you see that Pages tab, or the Pages button on, on this website, um, if you click that, there's a drop-down menu that'll move you back and forth between pretty much all of our bioinformatics web pages. So we're starting on the uh, Undergraduate Applied Bioinformatics Club site, and we're gonna be doing that uh, for a couple meetings this semester, where, like I said, we'll, we'll be starting with Command Line Blast. And uh, what we're gonna do for the students there is have them sign up for a BioCAD account. Um, is anyone familiar with BioCat here? Is anyone uh, at Pitt State familiar with BioCat? No. No, we're not. So BioCat actually means that you never have to worry about uh, the size of your lab's uh, computer or the size of your computer when you're running these kinds of projects. You have access to, as a, a researcher in Kansas, you have access to the largest compute cl uh, cluster in the state for free. So uh, what we would do is get everybody uh, accounts on BioCat, and then we can install and run software uh, from there rather than from our local computer, which 
for any of this kind of data, that's what you're going to want to do anyway. It's too large to be running it on your, tying up your local machines, and it's definitely too large for laptops. So that's the plan for that, and we'll be sending out emails um, to invite people to the first meeting, which will probably be in a couple weeks. And like I said, it's not a ton. We're only going to have three or four meetings for the semester and see how that goes. And at the Cambry um, meeting in the December, I think, we're going to give out a certificate for the people who participated. And um, we also have a journal club that is currently being used mostly by uh, researchers and postdocs and graduate students, although undergrads are welcome to attend. Um, what we talk about in the journal club is bioinformatics tools. So we, we read, a lot of times when a new bioinformatics tool is created, they roll it out with an introductory journal article. And they uh, compare it to the other current tools, and they talk about the algorithm that's behind it. So you kind of learn how it does what it does, and then how that compares to the existing uh, tools. So we've been doing that for a semester now, and um, it's going pretty well. The, the main things that we talk about are uh, genome assembly, transcriptome assembly, assembly merging like this, and uh, expression data. I think next week, actually, we have Brooke Friedley from KUMC, who's a genomic statistician, who's going to be talking about the basics of analysis, statistical analysis, of expression data. So um, that, that's going to be a real treat. And I think she's got some extra material in addition to the paper to present to us. So that's the Journal Club, and that meets on Wednesdays uh, at noon over the Polycom, so anyone's invited to attend. Um, in addition to that, uh, KSU uh, here, uh, the Olson Lab, uh, Bradley Olson's lab, and my lab, the uh, Cambry Bioinformatics Corps uh, at KSU, hosted a Perl course over the summer. And Justin Blumenthal and a team of amazing researchers hosted a Python workshop at KUL over the summer. And um, KUL was kind enough to make all of their course material available. Open Source is the name of it. So What's that? Can you okay, we're not hearing anything. This is still on mute. We're not hearing anything. All right. So, um, so we have a Perl. Uh, we had a Perl tutorial and a Python tutorial over the summer, and all of the lecture material and all of the exercises and the solutions have been made available on our website. So again, if you just go to the Pages tab, there's a drop-down menu that says Perl and Python tutorials, and that will take you there to to uh, that page. And we just started this with um, I5K. Um, in conjunction with K. Embry. So this is brand new. Um, is anyone out there familiar with GitHub? Okay. Anyone at Pitt State familiar with GitHub? No. Okay. So uh, if you start using scripts, probably the first thing that you do is start uh, finding scripts that exist on the web, modifying them, and running them. And 90% of the time when you find them on the web, you're going to find them on GitHub. Uh, it's actually one of the more popular websites in the world currently, uh, but you don't really start using it until you start using scripts. So um, what we've created is basically uh, a kind of online file system for us to store our scripts in as a community. So anyone can join this, um, and we're trying to make the group as large as possible so that we end up with uh, the ability to share scripts rather than to have to redundantly create them in every lab, you know, as we face the same kind of data to analyze. So there's no real limitation on what kind of scripts you can add to it. We don't care about what language you're writing in. Um, right now, the idea is that we create uh, in the, the major, in the organization, the Cambry Scripture organization, we're creating repositories, which are just like directories or folders. And we, we're making a repository for every topic. So if you don't see your topic represented, you can make a new repository. And then we recommend that once you are in that correct repository, uh, you make a lab folder for yourself so you can see where your scripts are right away. That just makes it a little easier to navigate. But once we have GitHub set up like that with all of the scripts available for people, you can actually search 
just this organization and find you know all of the examples of a script that handles this this kind of um, this kind of operation. Like for example, uh, running common assembly software and then generating assembly statistics using a different software for your assemblies. So. Um, I would also recommend that if you use it, you add a little brief description about the script that you made to the readme file. That's what I've been doing, and I think that means that the, the, when you enter a repository, you can see just briefly what all is available there. So um, a lot of people aren't familiar with GitHub, so I just wrote down a couple uh, brief examples of why GitHub is so powerful. For one thing, um, it has very well-developed version control which means that if somebody changes a script, and somebody in your lab, say, changes a script, and then you go back and look at it, and you say, no, 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 I think I like the previous version, or what exactly was it they changed here, and how is that changing the way it operates, you can actually look at a history, kind of backtrack through a history of that, and see highlighted you know, red lines for where you've deleted some, some text, or green for where you've added text, and, and track all of the modifications. So, Version control becomes really important when you're dealing with scripts because you want to make sure you're talking about the most recent version generally. That's generally the first way to debug what it is that you're doing. And um, there's a website on Git that, that offers a lot of good points about what, what its value is. Uh, the other thing is that it provides continuity within labs. I think a lot of labs have had the experience of a student um, finishing up their research and leaving and then their organization or their file system uh, is kind of a mystery to the people who remain behind. And GitHub allows you to have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a really common experience. And, and GitHub allows you to know exactly where your lab scripts are and exactly what the latest version of them was, not have to wonder whether the latest version was on this machine or that machine. Um, you can also have it automatically update scripts you know, on, on your uh, various machines. but you can keep it as a web resource as well. So the other thing that I think is an advantage is that it, it could increase collaboration and sharing of workflows. That it's really easy to say, um, you know, oh, I have a script for running that software, and rather than finding it and emailing it to someone, just say, just go to my GitHub account, check it out there. Um, also, you don't even have to suggest to someone that it exists. They can search for it. So another thing about that is it's a good way and it's a common way to distribute code for your publication. A lot of times you'll see that you know someone refers to in their methods a custom script. It's not very useful or reproducible when you, when you just refer to a custom script and then never provide it to the community. But if you uh, store it on GitHub, then you can have a more complete method section and point people directly to exactly what it was you did. And um, Git also has a huge following. So among the people that follow Git are the Broad Institute and the developer of BWA, which is actually kind of the hallmark of, align of sequence aligners. Um, he's often called the al alignment, alignment god, I think. <laughs> and uh, the developer of Oasis and Velvet, which are two very, very popular sequence assembly uh, algorithms. Um, also Pacific Biosciences, which if you want to talk about kind of a cutting edge uh, sequencing technology, um, they distribute their uh, code on Git, so that it's open source and easy to access, unlike, I don't know how many of you have worked with Illumina data, but that's kind of an opposite strategy to, <laughs> to making your software available. So, um, so you've got a lot of high-end users, you've got a lot of good quality scripts that you can find and modify to your own taste on GitHub, and it also provides that continuity between labs and ability to co collaborate more easily. So that's just a quick overview of the resources that Cambry has to offer. And you can find links to all of them on our blog site. Um, and with that, I guess I'd like to ask if anyone has any questions. Yeah, so this is Virginia. I wonder if you'd be willing to send us a copy of your PowerPoint that I could post on um, our Canvas uh, biology website so that students and faculty in biology or chemistry could have access to what you've talked about in specific sites? Yes, definitely. Um, actually, what I was thinking was that I would post it, uh, a PDF copy of it up on um, our website and then email out the address. And you can download the PDF 
from our Google Drive there. But I can also directly email you a copy of it. Doesn't matter. That'll work for me, too, just so we have access to it, particularly so I can drum up some interest in the, the club, the bioinformatics sure. club. Sure. And, you know, we have ideas for the, for the exercises for the bioinformatics club. I think building a local BLAST database is actually a really useful skill to have. Once you learn how to do it, it takes seconds to do, and it can help you accomplish something that you really couldn't do uh, without, it, without the ability to use a tool like that. But if researchers uh, can think of some skill that they would like their students to have, too, we're flexible. We can change the curricula a little uh, to, to gear it more towards something you might want your students to know how to do. So definitely give us feedback on that. And I'll probably ask uh, Sarah and the outreach coordinators to distribute um, just an email with the link to one of our blog pages in it. And like I said, you can find all of them through that. And even there's a protocols page that we've switched to GitHub, but there's, it's still, the protocols page is still on our site, so you can um, just click to our GitHub account from there as well. Sarah's been posting all of the undergraduate seminars. Mm -hmm. on the Kimberly site, so you probably need to send it to me. Right. Do any students have any questions about it? Could um, I? <laughs> this is Jason from um, Pittsburgh State University. I have a question about the bioinformatics. I mean, um, I understand for a biologist, you need to know something about Bioinformatics, I mean, just depends on what kind of level you can reach because we right. were not trained right. as a, a um, software engineer. I mean, right. in the future, right. I mean, you see the collaboration across different disciplines. I mean, will the I mean, biological, uh, biolog biology department, I mean, in the future, will they hire someone who are trained as a software engineer so they can help biologists to write something for them instead of the biologists to to write the program themselves. Yeah, I, I think yeah. the answer is that they already are. That a lot of biology departments and a lot of individual labs are already hiring their own specialists. Yeah. Um, in addition, right. I know Kay Embry is paying bioinformatics specialists to work with the researchers in our community. Um, the real issue becomes uh, scale and ability for them to process all of the data that, that people want processed. That um, okay. I totally agree with you that it, I, I'm not suggesting that biologists need to understand how to write their own bioinformatics tools. I guess what I'm saying is that any uh, little move you can make in terms of learning some of those steps could increase the ability of your lab to or could speed up the, the research in your lab, that you wouldn't have to wait for someone else to, to do yes, that. Yes. Yeah, and then increasingly absolutely. the wait time is ticking up as, as more and more people are generating data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes, thank you. Thanks for the question. You guys are fascinated, right? I, I know I see some questions out there. I just wanted to say, Jennifer, that um, this is Sarah, that we are recording We're recording this seminar also, so it will be on our website probably next week. So if anybody missed anything or oh, great. Um, wants to go back and review anything, then um, I will have that posted next week. So Great, Sarah. Thanks. And do you mind, um, did you hear us talking about posting the link to our blog there? You may already have it on the bioinformatics page, but do you think we could post it below the uh, presentation? Okay, super quick before you guys get out of the room. Uh, just give me some, some thoughts that you have about this kind of thing. Like, just off the top of your head. Hey, it's good to go. <laughs> so, just off the top of your head, like, do you like, um, are you terrified of the idea of having to use a command line? Like, just a command prompt and type into it? Okay. Yeah, so I would recommend that if any undergraduate is scared of looking at the command line, so was I and so was every other graduate student in biology that I've seen look at the command line for the first time. And uh, the only way to get past that is to play with it. So look for experiences where you can interact with it, just you know, kind of baby steps. And uh, before long, it will not be something that's that terrifying. It might be frustrating like everything else in science, but it won't be scary anymore. <laughs> but avoiding it doesn't help get over that, uh, that learning curve. So 
I think we're finished up a little early here. Uh, if anyone else, anything else to add or any Cambry business that they want to talk about, could open up the floor. <laughs>